today I'm going to be taking a look at another piece of aviation audio equipment. It's this bulky device behind me here and uh, quite a heavy one as well. This would have been used on an aircraft for playing back the in-flight entertainment, the thing that you would hear when you plug your headphones into the armrest. No doubt it contains music and it's still got the tapes in it as well. I have featured in the past some other aviation items. The first one was a device that was used for playing back pre-recorded announcements, as well as the background music that you might hear when you were boarding the aircraft. Included in those pre-recorded announcements was some emergency ones for things such as ditching on water. I'll put a link to that at the top of the screen. More recently, I featured an even older tape-based device. It was for in-flight cockpit voice recording. This was not a black box recorder. I do have a black box flight recorder. I've had one for quite a while. I've stored it away in my locker. One day we'll have a look at that one. This one though, we'll have a look at now. So let's get on with it. Okay, now first off, to temper expectations, I've got no intention of trying to get this device working. I wouldn't stand a cat in hell's chance. If we just have a look around the back here, that socket isn't exactly one that I've got an appropriate connector to go into. As far as this though, there'd be power going into here and then there's going to be audio output, but no doubt that would be amplified somewhere else on another device on the aircraft. And also there'd be control circuitry going into this because this device doesn't have any buttons on it itself. And on an aircraft, the power going into this would be at 400 hertz. So I think our best bet is just to take the cassettes out of here and have a listen to them on something else. We'll do that in a moment though, but I don't know if you can see inside here, there's instructions as to where each tape is to be placed. 1A, 2A, 3A, they're also color coded. You can see the colors matching on the cassettes themselves. Now the fact we've got an A designation indicates that there's a B as well. And indeed those around the other side. So if I open this up, we can see that we've got 1B, 2B and 3B. Notice at the top here, they've only got a single pinch roller. Now, if it's an auto reverse cassette deck, you'd have a pinch roller at either side to draw the tape in that direction. So the fact there's only one indicates that this is not an auto reverse deck, which then explains why we've got the A and B tapes, because the B no doubt plays after the A has finished, and then this would be automatically rewinding so that whatever time somebody plugged their headphones in, you'd be listening to music rather than a tape winding itself. Let's have a look at the heads on here. Right now, that is an intriguing head layout. It makes me think that the audio on these cassettes is going to be recorded in a non-standard manner. Just to explain, on a standard cassette, you've got your side A and your side B. When it's played in a standard cassette deck, the tape effectively is split down the middle as far as the audio goes, and you get the stereo left and right at the bottom here, and then left and right at the top. And when you're playing in a cassette deck, a standard one that isn't auto-reverse, it's the side nearest the bottom where the stereo head is connected to, and then you'd flip it over, and again, it's the bottom that's getting played. Well, in this one, we've got four pickups here. There's one at the top on this side, that's the highest one, and then it goes over to that side, so it's staggered, that's the next one down, and then this one, and then finally that one over there. So it makes me think that there's four separate tracks of audio on these tapes. Now, since this isn't an auto reverse deck, it's not playing this side, then that side, it perhaps is something that you could select. You could choose from four different audio programs just from this cassette, they're being mono. We've also, of course, got two other decks here. So there's a total of 12 different audio programs that you could pick from. Oh, and you might have noticed the 0194 on each of these, which I presume is the date. But if we go around to the back of the unit, we can see that is March the 25th, 94. And also notice at the top, manufactured under DBX license. If we flip round to the front here, we can see the DBX logo. So presumably this uses the DBX noise reduction system to reduce the hiss off a tape, something that would be especially important if the tapes are running at a slower speed. I don't know if they are, we'll find out later on. So at the top right there, we've got plenty of patent numbers. Beneath there, we've got the full name of the device. Well, almost the full name. It won't fit on the label, but presumably it stands for the Passenger Entertainment Tape Reproducer. The model number, the manufacture date, it's made in Japan and it weighs approximately 18 pounds. 
Okay, let's have a listen to one of these tapes. Now, if my theory is right, we should hear two things at the same time. Of course, we won't hear all four because it's just got a stereo head in here. So let's just get the tape in there and have a listen. Well, that's definitely more than one thing. Quite hard to make out. Let's uh, try one of the other ones. Sounded like it was playing at the normal speed, though. Right, so that's Video Killed the Radio Star and a story. I'll have to be careful with the content matches on this one. Sounds like Jack and the Beanstalk, that, so that'll be a story for children. So maybe there are 12 different stations available. I say stations, different programmes that you could pick. Let's just take a closer look at a cassette to see what information can be gleaned from its label. Well, first off, it looks like these tapes were in use in February 2006 on an Airbus A320. But this initially confused me. I assumed it was something to do with the route, but it turns out that In-Flight Dublin is the name of an airline content service provider. They are the people who will have recorded these tapes, and thanks to a patron for pointing this out. Also, something I initially misinterpreted was the out printed at the top left of all these labels. Rather than it referring to the root, it's most likely just an instruction into how to put the tapes into the machine, this side out. In fact, if you were to turn these tapes over, you'll find that they're just regular off-the-shelf Fuji DR90s, a Type 1 cassette, likely just chosen because they were still readily available at this time. And of course, if you did put a tape in the machine the wrong way around, all the audio would have played in reverse. And perhaps the most important bit of information on this cassette is that the tapes were used by my travel out of the UK. So I think we should just spend and a few moments to explain who my travel were. The company was founded as a travel agency in 1972. It was originally named Air Tours and the head office was in Rochdale, England. The airline part of the business started up in 1990 as Air Tours International Airways, but following various acquisitions, the company as a whole was rebranded as My Travel in 2002. Now, as you can see from this list, the majority of the airline fleet consisted of Airbus A320s. That's the same type of aircraft that my cassettes appear to have been used on. Now, in 2007, my travel was merged with Thomas Cook, which resulted in the closure of the my travel head office in Rochdale and the loss of a thousand jobs. Ultimately, though, Thomas Cook itself also collapsed in 2019 after 182 years in business. So, in a nutshell, the tapes that I've got here were used in a plane like this back in 2006, shortly before everything at my travel went to heck. Some serious solenoids in here. Look at these things. No messing about with those. I'd imagine there'd be a really pleasing clunk when they were operated. This one's a little bit more reluctant. I think it's been bent over the years. You can see on the bottom here where it's been scraped when it slid in and out of its unit on the plane, but I think we can get it off. There we go. Well, not a great deal to see yet. I think we should take this circuit board out and flip it over, have a look at the other side. You can see this could be unplugged and replaced. We've got some capacitors here, plenty of heat sinks. TC4053BP, that's a NEC chip there. A few Toshiba ones, plenty of variable resistors up here. And then on this side, all of these chips along the top have the DBX logo on. The chip number is an AN6291, and there's a total of seven of those. And I thought that was going to be the bottom, but it turns out when you move it out of the way, there is another circuit board here that is full of chips as well. This was a very complicated device and no doubt very expensive when it was new. Right, so we've determined that each tape has four tracks that are playing at the same time. And of course, all three tapes are going to be playing at the same time. So that means there's a total of 12 things that could be listened to individually. I was interested to find out what those things were. I could hear that one was spoken word, but presumably there's pop, maybe there's classical. 
I just want to listen to them in isolation. Ideally, I'd have a Porter studio. I do have one somewhere, but it's in need of repair. So I'm just going to play them back in a normal cassette deck. You foolish boy. You took these worthless beans in exchange for a cow. Right, so what I'm going to do here to get all four audio tracks is to rewind this tape back to the beginning, record this side for the first five minutes, then flip it over, record it for five minutes until it goes back to the beginning again, and then I'm going to reverse those two tracks, and then all four tracks I'm going to split out individually to figure out what the different kinds of audio are. And then I'm going to repeat that for the other two tapes that are on this side, and hopefully we'll be able to figure out what the individual programs were that you could choose from. OK, so after recording what effectively was the first five minutes of each of these three cassettes, I then put that recording into Audacity, split it down into its individual tracks. I've got a total of 12 tracks, and any of those that I'd recorded in reverse, I reversed back so I could hear them in the correct direction. So then I could have a listen to see exactly what was on these. <laughs> Will you exchange your cow for my beans? He asked impatiently. It turns out there aren't 12 individual choices because cassette one only had two choices. The audio that was on what effectively is track one was repeated on track four and similarly the audio that was on track two was repeated on track three which to me would suggest that this was a stereo option so you've got two programs in stereo so we've got a total of 10 different options spread across all three cassettes the other ones were all in mono so each of these hold four things now Going back to option one, from listening to just the first couple of tracks on there, that seemed to be jazz and blues. Option number three, when you listen to it a little bit more, there's other songs and things for children. So it turns out it's just a, a children's station, effectively, I'll call it a station. And if we go down into option four with Buggles Video Killed the Radio Star and the Cars, I suspect that was a 1970s station uh, buggles just getting in there in 1979 similarly option six starship we built this city and survive at eye of the tiger i presume that's a 1980s station again i'd have to listen to a lot more of this to properly determine that but then some of the others i'm not quite sure where they'd fit in some could have been like current music perhaps in fact listening to some of these i'm not even aware of the track so they kind of after the time when i stopped listening to what was current in the charts but down at the bottom here option 10 that seems to be the classical choice so in total there were 10 different things that you could have chosen to listen to if you plug your headphones into the appropriate part of the plane which was playing back what was coming off these cassettes OK, so just a quick recap. Tapes 1, 2 and 3 played simultaneously. Coming from those three tapes were a total of 10 different selectable audio channels that were all being played at the same time. Once the A set of tapes had reached the end, the machine moved straight on to playing the B tapes while those A tapes were rewound back to the beginning and this way the machine could just carry on playing uninterrupted for as long as it was activated. Now, when you plug your headphones into the armrest socket, you'd be joining the audio at whatever point the tapes had got up to. Using the up and down control buttons, you could cycle through those various feeds. Given that it would only take a total of one and a half hours before everything on the machine started repeating, this might have been a system only used on shorter flights, but then again, there was always the option to switch across to one of the other nine audio feeds if you'd heard everything available on a channel, and of course there might well have been some other video entertainment that was available as well. You'll have no doubt noticed that the player was manufactured by the Japanese electronics giant Matsushita, a word that, however you pronounce it, a lot of people will still say that you're doing it wrong. But it doesn't matter anymore because they're now known as Panasonic Avionics, a company that's so good it rhymes. And they're still providing in-flight entertainment systems. Apparently, they're the world leaders in this field. Now, they started in avionics in 1979 after adapting a system that they created for passenger entertainment on the bullet train to be used on an aircraft instead. There is a history section on their website, but unfortunately, it prefers to talk more about their range of digital solutions. However, I think that this tape-based system must be the last analogue descendant of that original bullet train system. 
I suspect that if you told somebody who was traveling on an aircraft back in what looks like February 2006, that the audio that they were listening to through their headphones was originating from a regular ferric audio cassette, they'd be a little bit surprised. They'd probably assume that the audio was coming from something a little bit more sophisticated. I mean, not to say that this device is not a sophisticated cassette player, but by 2006, most people, if they were listening to their audio on the go, were using some kind of digital format. The audio you heard on your plane was from really a different era, but still, they wouldn't have noticed DBX noise reduction, as well as all the noise in the cabin, it probably sounded perfectly fine. And there's no point replacing a unit like this, because as we saw, it looks like it was very expensive to put this thing together much better just to keep it in use in the aircraft and then at a certain point when you decide to get rid of the aircraft get rid of the cassette deck with it and then the new one that comes along will have all the latest tech in it no doubt some kind of digital in-flight entertainment system as well but that's what I like about things like this. It tells you a little bit of a story. What was going on behind the scenes? Technology sometimes hangs on in the most unusual places. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this one here today. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.